This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources has voted to move Deb Holland's interior nomination to the full U.S. Senate. The vote included 11 in favor and 9 opposed. Holland's nomination will now go to the full Senate, where she is expected to be confirmed. Confirmation for nominees requires a simple majority, and at least one Republican, Maine Senator Susan Collins, has said she will support Holland. The nomination has been contentious, with some Republicans taking aim at Holland's stances on fossil fuels and pledging to try to defeat her. President Joe Biden made additional disaster assistance available to the La Jolla, La Jolla Band of Luciano Indians. The declaration okays extra federal funds for public assistance projects undertaken as a result of severe storms, flooding, landslides, and mudslides. Under the major disaster declaration issued for the La Jolla Band of Luciano Indians on March 26, 2019, federal funding was made available for public assistance. Under the President's order today, the federal share for public assistance has been increased to 90% of the total eligible costs. The Urban Indian Health Institute distributed over $500,000 in grants to nine urban native organizations nationwide to battle chronic diseases in Indian country. The grants are part of a plan to build public health infrastructure among urban American Indian and Alaska Native organizations through the use of indigenous methods, frameworks, and evaluation approaches. The health initiative is supported by multiple grants from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Or awardees will be operating programs that address chronic respiratory disease and promote healthy lifestyles. Programs will range from collecting data for community needs assessment to virtual curriculum about respiratory disease to the development of resources regarding tobacco use and cessation to asthma education and connecting nurses with asthma patients. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic and workplace restrictions, the Urban Institute grants allow organizations to run programs virtually. A Pueblo museum in New Mexico is taking marketing to the sky. Instead of buying a billboard, they created a hot air balloon to attract business and attention. Indian Country Today's Aliyah Chavez has more. Soaring high across New Mexico skies, Iyani on the horizon is the name of the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center's newest ambassador. The hot air balloon is 86 feet tall and is capable of lifting 6,000 pounds, the equivalent of 12 to 14 people. It was developed in September in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic by the entire staff at the Albuquerque-based Cultural Center. The designs, along the balloon itself, were inspired by New Mexico's 19 pueblos. Along the balloon are iconic patterns, including black and red triangles, as well as arrows and cloud steps. The center's head of marketing says there's a lot that goes into designing a giant balloon. And we just took the time to make sure that it looked beautiful, it was meaningful to the Pueblos, and also that it was going to work. You know, we'd never designed a balloon before. In addition to the balloon, the center has also created downloadable coloring pages for children. All of this, Emily says, is to bring attention and business to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, which is the head of tourism for New Mexico's 19 Pueblo nations. What we like to say is this balloon costs us less than it would be to have a billboard on a freeway in Albuquerque. Organizers hope in the future, the balloon can set its sights on the city's Balloon Fiesta, which features more than 600 hot air balloons from all over the world. Reporting from Albuquerque, Aliyah Chavez, Indian Country Today. The balloon is expected to have a lifespan of eight years and will fly more than 200 times a year. These are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahant. When we come back, updates from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Forest Service. And museums and artists are breaking ground. Stay with us. This is Indian Country Today. The U.S. Department of Agriculture 
has announced the appointment of Zach Ducheneau as the administrator of the Farm Service Agency. Ducheneau is executive director of the Intertribal Agriculture Council. He has been a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribes Council and he operates a family ranch in South Dakota. To put this appointment into perspective, we reached out to Janie Hip. She is the president and CEO of the Native American Agriculture Fund. Mark, <laughs> it is extremely significant. Um, I just have to, I have to remind everyone <laughs> that um, the Farm Service Agency at USDA is one of two banks at USDA. And the other bank is over at Rural Development and they do all rural economic development. The other, the bank that, that, that is over on Zach's side of the house now, which is wonderful to say, um, is the bank that deals with farm lending. And they do literally uh, lending for ownership of agricultural operations, farms and ranches, and they do operating loans for people all over the country. And um, they've been around since the beginning of that, that department. And it's not lost on me that, that the Native American Ag Fund came about because of discrimination in lending. And there was the Keeps Eagle case that was brought on all Native farmers and ranchers' behalfs that knocked around in the, in the litigation arena for almost 20 years. And now the fund is up and running. And, and now we look and Zach Ducheneau, <laughs> a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, is the administrator of the farm service agency against which we actually sought compensation for discrimination. So it is, it's never happened to have a native person who is the head of that agency, but it also is so pivotal that it was Zach. And the reason why I say that, Mark, is Zach is one of our nation's experts on how agricultural lending is not quite right right now. And this has been my career as well. And we've got as a country to get it right <laughs> on how we extend capital and credit to all farmers and ranchers. We're in the middle of an intergenerational shift within the agricultural sector, younger people, we need them to stay in, in the game <laughs> and with us, no matter who they are. And he really has come up through his own personal experience as a, as a rancher, but also through his role as executive director and kind of coming up the ranks of Intertribal Ag Council. You know, Intertribal Ag Council was created in the 80s farm financial crisis. And they emerged from that really pivotal and horrible time period for all the country's farmers and ranchers, but it hit us worse than anybody. And to have Zach with that deep, deep knowledge of how hard it is <laughs> to actually extend credit to farmers and ranchers and how we actually should be thinking about it in a different way at this critical moment, not just for native producers, but for all producers who are really thinking about who's coming up behind us, but also how do we do agriculture for the next hundred years facing climate changes that are way beyond just the normal disasters that we all have to face. Thanks, Janie Hip from the Native American Agriculture Fund. Earlier this week, the U.S. Forest Service withdrew its final environmental impact statement for a huge copper mine near Superior, halting a land swap for Oak Flat, deemed sacred by many Apaches and other Southwestern tribes. Nyleen Pike was one of the youngest people to ever testify in front of Congress at age 13 when she spoke out against mining at Oak Flat. I asked her about this. I felt um, a glimpse of hope. Right now we're in a crucial time with the Oak Flat fight against Resolution Copper and Tonto National Forest. So to see um, Biden's administration put a hold on, on the land exchange, um, I think it's the first step of many steps that need to come because as of right now, 
even though that the land transfer has been halted, it doesn't mean that it'll be completely protected. We need a congressional act uh, to put that in place for the protection of Oak Flat. Um, but in this long fight that we've been fighting to protect this place, I see that you know people are really waking up, and I think that Biden's administration kind of needs to understand that um, this climate action plan that they have or that they want to put in process for the United States, this mine will not will not coincide with that. And so I think that's a good realization for his administration to see that, and I hope to see it to be um, be protected forever. I think about when I was 13 and I first testified in front of Congress, um, I always told them, I'm young, I'm 13, so I'm going to come back, like, you know, and so seeing that and, you know, and we do, we keep coming back, it takes persistence and, you know, you have to be consistent because you, you think about Congress, it's always changing, you get different political leaders who are elected in and who don't know the issue and things like that, so we have to keep retelling our story but that's a part of the fight is that we have to take action it has to take consistency and we have to just keep doing it and doing it and and we're fine with that and the reason why we have to be fine with that is because it's the future that's at stake you know we have so much at stake in in, in this country and it's not it's the survival of our apache religion is what we're fighting for and so if this land exchange was to go through it's our, our religion and our way of life and the land is being murdered. I heard a, a quote from uh, Indian Collective and they had said uh, that we need to stop uh, putting jobs against the environment. And we see that too much, you know, it's kind of that cycle of history, that cycle of genocide, that cycle of historical trauma. And, you know, in this moment in time, there's a whole transition in eras. And, and it's really beautiful to see, and I'm really blessed to be a part of that. And to see that the Apache stronghold has stuck through this for over 18 years is really a blessing to be a part of. I'm, I'm 21 and, and knowing that the fight had began, you know, 18 years to protect Oak Flat. Um, I was five years old in Superior with my grandfather while he was pe speaking to the townspeople and, you know, going to Oak Flat and partaking in our ceremonies and, and being able to pray. And I think that when you think about the Oak Flat fight, you see that it's um, when you're there and you feel the spirit and, and you're a part of all of that, you really have this understanding that this light needs to be shed on everyone. Thanks, Nyleen Pike. When we come back, a museum on the move. The Tomaquac Museum is on the move. In rural Exeter, Rhode Island, it's a hidden gem of the region. The museum's director, Loren Spears, pl shares plans to partner with the University of Rhode Island to build a new museum complex that will be accessible to all. It was founded in 1958 by Eva Butler, who was an anthropologist, and Princess Red Wing, who was Narragansett Wampanoag, elder, ancestor, knowledge keeper, educator. So we've had this unique experience as an organization that has always had an indigenous voice. Tomaquag Museum as an independent nonprofit, we highlight the Narragansett, which I'm a, a citizen of, and we also highlight tribes of southern New England in our collection. So we have a very vast collection of our cultural belongings, which is a word we use to decolonize the word artifact and our archival collections of pictures and maps and writings and things of that nature. So we have a very extensive collection and we're really excited for more people to see more of that collection in our new facility, including having an archive research center where people um, that are researchers and academics and book authors and filmmakers can create their own works from this knowledge. We really respect our knowledge keepers, our artists, our culture bearers, and we really try to make sure that we can uh, find funding to remunerate them. And we also advocate that when other people are reaching out for these knowledge keepers, that they're remunerating them as well. Because often, uh, communities of color in general are disrespected for their knowledge that's 
about their community, their culture, their history in a way that they're not respected the way that um, quote unquote experts are. And I am saying these are the experts about our community. And so when other organizations want to reach out to them through Tomaqua Museum, we remind them of that and encourage them to uh, be respectful of their knowledge and of their time and to elevate their, their gifts where they belong. And so that's really important. And I think through our new facility, we'll be able to continue to grow that advocacy for indigenous knowledge and culture bearers and respecting those, those knowledge keepers. Um, that's really important. And to elevate um, the, the respect for the traditional ecological knowledge that our communities have and the access to the land and the resources that are there in, in a truly traditional and respectful way, that's really important. And, and having the 18 acres at the University of Rhode Island, um, it's still a rural space, but it's more conducive to access for tourists. It's on a bike path. Um, it's on a main thoroughfare where tourists would be going to the city of Newport um, and to the oceans by the town of Narragansett named after our people at the bay <laughs> named after our people and our nation. Um, that would be really important. And, and also to collaborate not only with the University of Rhode Island, but other uh, higher ed institutions in the region that we already collaborate with to help educate their students, um, particularly those that are going into history, anthropology, archaeology, education, so that we can break the trends and the mis representation that continues to be pervasive in those fields um, to ensure that our students, my very first grandson, who's two and a half, when he hits school, that they're not still being told we don't exist. Um, you know, the history for the Narragansett people is a very difficult history of detribalization in the 1880s, which took 101 years to rectify. But in doing so, there's all kinds of written uh, material by quote unquote experts that say we don't exist. And we had to really fight our way. And people like Princess Redwing and many of her contemporaries that were born in the late 1800s were fighting all through that time to ensure that we're here. And our stories in this museum now and in our future uh, facility will tell all those stories about um, the difficult things that we went through, but the triumphs and successes of people that have uh, ensured that we're still here and that we can continue on. And the work that I do is so that my grandchildren and great grandchildren to come will um, have this place that they can call their own, that they can see themselves in, that they can be part of as an intern through our IEN program, uh, Indigenous Empowerment Network program, and to um, feel validated and that schools will start to incorporate the knowledge that we're teaching them through the professional development to incorporate that into their curricula um, to ensure that history is talking, told in its totality. Thanks, Lorraine Spears the Narragansett Director of the Tomaquac Museum. Marlena Miles is a self-taught Spirit Lake Dakota, Mohegan and Muscogee artist. Her art brings modernity to indigenous history, languages and oral traditions. She has a solo exhibition at the Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The exhibit, you know, I worked with the Russian Art Museum um, growing up. I loved Russian history, I loved Russian literature, music, and like I never thought as a Native American that I could be in the museum, but they had wanted to, you know, widen their base of who they're reaching because their museum is located in a Native sort of neighborhood of Minneapolis. So they reached out to me and I, you know, I did a lot of years worth of research on the interactions between the Russians and Alaska natives and the work I created, you know, I don't try to put myself into the story of the Russians or native Alaskans. I just try to, you know, open people's minds to what went on and how people today are still affected by that history. And, you know, there's differences in how they treated native people. Like, of course, there's still the genocide and that going on, but there are also like the Russian Orthodox Church was actually more kind than maybe the missionaries in other locations. So it, it was interesting for me to learn a different 
history than the one that I know about my people, I guess, and interactions with Europeans. How did you get interested in computers? So I grew up in Minneapolis, you know, in an urban environment. And so I think Native people have always been innovative. Whenever we get a new piece of technology, we find a way to tell our culture, our history through it. And so as a kid, my my mom bought us a computer so that we would stay out of trouble. And I really got into coding and making my own art onto it as a teenager back before everybody had this kind of technology. Cause I guess it was in 1998, back when people had dial up internet. So I was like the, in the early days of the internet that I was creating, starting my digital art journey. Growing up in an urban area, there was never anything that really taught about Dakota people. Um, it's the same with like that exhibit when I did for the Russians and Alaskan natives. I think most of us just learn a paragraph about how America bought Alaska and that's it. Like you don't learn anything else. And so um, growing up here in the Twin Cities, there was never anything that talked about the Dakota people here. So that's why I wanted to create free resources like the Dakota land map that shows our language is still here today, that we're still here today, that you know, our languages aren't just stuck in the past, that we're, we have words for everyday things as well. So, you know, I want the urban kids to look at Minneapolis and realize, you know, this is our home too. It's not just your reservation, like our homelands include these big urban areas. That was Spirit Lake Dakota artist, Marlena Miles. Let's take a look at some of her computer animations. Last year was about working from home. And right as the pandemic took hold, Indian Country Today began a daily broadcast. And so we broadcast from home. My studio, Patty Talahungava's studio, we use Zoom and other technology to put together this broadcast. A lot of folks asked why. One answer is easy. Because we still live in a media world where there's not a single Native American working in broadcast on a national stage. Too many of our stories never surface. Sure, the media covers the big stories, the appointment of Representative Deb Holland to run the Interior Department. But what about the significant appointments beyond that? Leaders like Zach Dushno running the Farm Service Agency, a key bank for lending to farmers across the country. Well, that's a story you will only hear about on this broadcast. Executive producer Patty Talahungava had an idea from her past the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center. She's Hopi and she was a student at Phoenix Indian. She helped renovate one of the buildings that had served as the elementary school and it became the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center, complete with a gallery to tell the story of the government-run boarding school. The center is a great place for receptions and meetings and in normal times would be a regular community gathering place. Facilities still open, but with reduced capacity like so many others in our world right now. We worked with Native American Connections, the nonprofit that operates the center, and turned the boardroom into our new studio. We have worked to make it as safe as possible in a socially distant environment. We wanted to make sure that none of our staff got sick from doing their jobs. I love the irony of reinventing the boarding school experience. Our set includes floorboards from the old school. I remember reading old BIA school textbooks where the idea of writing, journalism, was that Native people had a future operating printing presses. Creating content? Not so much. Building a national news show from this facility? Unimaginable. We accomplished a lot here. One of the biggest challenges was election night. 
we had to expand the studio and create a control room and still keep people safe. We broadcast live for two hours on election night, reporting stories that, as usual, would not have been on television anywhere else. On March 15th, Indian Country Today moves to a new studio at Arizona PBS. This was our plan all along, and we are delighted to make it so. You'll see a new studio and hopefully a better broadcast, but the reason is a much bigger story. It's the idea that our stories deserve a national platform. Our news is important too. So for the final time, we sign off here in the temporary studio at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center. We appreciate this space where hundreds of Native children attended school, where we brought you so many important stories during this pandemic, and where we've given voice to our own people as experts in their own right. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world today. I'm Mark Trahan. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.